It is a great honor and a privilege to introduce Judith Israel. Your maiden name is Mayof. We're here in your beautiful home here in Israel. And But you originally come from, you were born in Denmark. Yes, I was born in Denmark. And um, my uh, background, my family background is um, on both sides, on both my father's and my mother's side. Uh, they came and fled Russia in uh, the beginning of the previous uh, century because of uh, the programs. Um, my, my grandfather on my mother's side uh, left a little earlier Russia because he kind of felt that the another war was coming up and he had already served in the Russian army um, for many years during the uh, they were sent uh, to join the war uh, against uh, Japan in the beginning of the previous century and they were meant to walk they walked all the way through uh, Russia from uh, uh, and arrived in Vladivostok. They arrived in Vladivostok after five months of walking and uh, then the war was over and they were lucky enough to be brought back on the newly finished railroad through Siberia. And um, he decided that he was not ready to join another war in the Russian army so uh, he picked up his uh, newly married wife and uh, brought her to Denmark. And so my mother just managed to be born in Denmark. Um, and uh, in 1912, when they arrived. And uh, my father's family, uh, they had a different story. They uh, after the uh, riots in Kiev, uh, they lived uh, not. F they lived in the area of uh, Belarus, and uh, uh, they decided that it was I impossible to live. So the uh, my grandfather took the five children, older children, and left behind his wife who was uh, pregnant with my father and uh, they came to Denmark they settled down they all started working and uh, it took them some years to get uh, stabilized and uh, then they had bought a house and they were all in business and they sent money back to my grandmother and he could bring my father who was by now two years old so that was, uh, um, this is more or less my background. We were, I was born in Denmark. My older sister was born three years earlier than me. And, uh, and uh, I grew up and went to Danish school. Well, what year were you born? I was born in 36, 1936. And uh, I have an older sister, she's 88, just turned 88, she's amazing, absolutely amazing. She is, if you look at her, you'll think she's 55. And you were in Copenhagen? In Copenhagen, yes. And uh, I had, uh, well, um, th this was the background, well, everything changed a little bit when the war started when the German uh, army occupied Denmark on the same day as uh, they occupied Norway and uh, I was in on the 9th of April in uh, 1940 I was three and a half years old but I remember this day as clearly as it was yesterday. Um, and why? Because we were out 
in the garden playing and uh, all of a sudden we heard these heavy, heavy transport planes coming in with terrible noise, very low over, over town and they were spreading pamphlets for the population uh, explaining how uh, they came to protect us and uh, we should uh, just uh, behave normally and not uh, it everything was okay it wasn't really so okay because uh, nobody agreed with it but uh, and besides these pamphlets were printed I've seen one they were printed in the worst possible Danish and with so many mistakes that it was laughable that uh, well, as a three and a half years old, I couldn't read, but I saw it later. Well, anyhow, life um, in the beginning, the Danes, of course, understood that they didn't have a chance against the German uh, war machine. And uh, there were some very, very brief fighting that ended very soon. And uh, then the Danes decided to make a kind of uh, arrangement with the with the Germans and um, uh, so uh, for the first couple of years there wasn't that much a change in our situation besides that all food was being rationed because now we had to supply the German army and the German population with uh, all the good food foodstuffs that the uh, Danish agriculture could uh, produce. Um, but uh, life still uh, went on more or less. We didn't really feel the, uh, the, the oppression. Um, but it changed in uh, 41 as uh, the, um, um, my father was, uh, and my mother, they were both communists and uh, the, um, the uh, Danish uh, government decided to forbid uh, the Communist Party. It became illegal and uh, they uh, tried to arrest the, uh, the, the active communists. So my father couldn't live home anymore and uh, um, he had to go underground and um, he, um, he arranged that we could meet him somewhere in town, in a park, and uh, we would go to Tivoli together, and uh, we would uh, walk in the forests uh, with him, but uh, he couldn't stay home. So what, um, and, and for the first, in, this happened in 41, and in 41 and 42, we had constant, constant health searches. They, uh, the Danish police came to make sure he would particularly, they would come around our birthdays where they were absolutely sure that he would be home to be with the family. But uh, they would come at night time and they would hammer on the door and this was the Danish police. And you remember it? In? You remember? You remember? Yes, yes, yes. I mean, listen, they were hammering on the doors and they came in and they turned everything upside down and looked under the beds and in the cupboards, etc. And then they decided, okay, he's not here. And then we could uh, clean up the mess and uh, go back to sleep. And this happened several times a week. Um, later on, the Gestapo would come together with the Danish police and uh, search for him. But um, my parents uh, made a wonderful arrangement. My father's work was originally... Um, uh, he was a, a traveling salesman. He was selling um, staplers and... Uh, yeah, like uh, bigger staplers to the fishermen yeah to the fishermen in the in the villages uh, around Denmark and he would go by train 
and bring his bicycle and then he would bicycle around all over Denmark and uh, this is uh, the reason that later when he started uh, together with the first groups the resistance against the German occupation they could use him as a uh, the connection between the various uh, resistance groups in uh, in Jutland on, on the islands and um, well but in order to be together with the family uh, my parents arranged uh, bought from friends uh, tents and made a tent camp in 41 the summer from May till September and also in 42 from May to September on the beach front on a fjord about 52 kilometers north of Copenhagen where it was totally isolated we were 10 meters from the water we had a wonderful time together and uh, we bought stuff from the farmers uh, living around us and uh, from the fishermen who were um, who supplied us with fish and uh, all the good stuff and we as children just simply had like uh, a life uh, in, uh, in in paradise for for these months and um, and this place here where we had the tent camp after after the war my father took my older sister on a bicycle tour and wanted to show her where we had been uh, camping out and um, on the way back they passed by a little red house that was for sale and my father said that will buy and this is what he did when he got some kind of small reparation for his uh, long stay in Germany during the war after he had been arrested by the Gestapo. Um, he got some uh, small reparation and with that he made the down payment for the Little Red Summer House. And we have kept it until like uh, four years ago we had to sell it and it, it broke my heart completely but uh, my oldest daughter is now living there and uh, and loves it can I ask how did your father get arrested well it's a long story um, my father was active uh, in this um, uh, resistance movement and uh, and one day he decided to go and visit his old mother who still lived in the house that the family had built uh, or, or bought uh, when they came from Russia so and she was very old she was in her, her 80s and uh, he went to see her but uh, in the neighboring house lived a German family um, who were one of the sons had been my father's uh, friend uh, as a child. He saw him going in there and called Gestapo and uh, they sent out two people. They didn't arrest him when he went out but they followed him and they followed him back to where he was uh, staying with his uh, resistance group and they arrested the whole lot of them and this was in uh, 43 and um, so uh, when um, in in 43 we had I had already started school the school year started uh, in Denmark in April, the school year. So I went to school April, May and half of June. And then it was the summer holiday. And then in that summer, the cooperation between the Danish government and the German occupations forces uh, 
totally collapsed. And uh, then the Germans were in full control. And uh, this is when the rumors started that now they are preparing to arrest the Danish Jews. My father was sitting in prison, not knowing anything about this development, um, because we couldn't visit him. And uh, so, um, um, it, when the rumors uh, got stronger and people already started uh, flee, fleeing to Sweden that had uh, declared that all the Danish Jews would be welcome even if they didn't uh, <laughs> if, if they didn't have a visa and um, but um, it, then we finally got the date that they had decided this action is going to happen on Erefrosh uh, Hashanah when uh, they were imagining that all Jewish families are sitting around a festive table and it will be uh, no problem just gathering them up. Well, but uh, the German Navy commander had leaked this information to some members of the Danish government that it brought this knowledge also to Markus Melcher, who, no, it was not Markus Melcher who was the rabbi. Yeah, he was, he was working as a rabbi, but I think it was his father, Schoenstein. Doesn't matter. But, uh, but when people came to the service on the 1st of October, which was on a Friday morning, um, they got the message that there will be no service, but everyone will have the duty to warn all the Jewish people they know, spread the rumor, and, uh, and make sure that everybody, nobody is allowed to stay in his house uh, during this night. Whoever is at home will be arrested and sent to Germany. And um, the, it worked rather well. I remember, I don't know how we got the message because we were not uh, religious and we, my father never went to the synagogue. Um, actually, I, the first time in my life I was ever in a synagogue was uh, when my older sister got married. Really? Yes, I must have been, uh, she got married 21, I, I was 18 at the first time I was inside the synagogue. But you knew, you knew growing up that you were Jewish? Yes, 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 absolutely. And you never kept like Pesach or... or no, my, my, my grandmother kept the kosher house and we celebrated all holidays with her and my grandmother from my mother's side and, and my grandparents, they were Yiddishists. They were not religious, but they kept all traditions Traditional. like uh, and uh, kept kosher. But, um, um, no, then we had to, we got the message that we couldn't be at home and uh, we were told not to bring luggage, not to bring anything, just pack as much clothes we can on us and go and stay with Christian friends. And, uh, and, and this is what we did the first night. And, uh, but he was afraid to keep us there. They made sure we would get uh, uh, another address of people who were willing to take us because he was also a member of a resistance group and uh, therefore in danger and it wasn't, wouldn't be safe. So the day after we were brought um, by taxi, you know, there were no private cars at all driving in Denmark during the occupation. There was no way of having fuel. So uh, only taxis and uh, ambulances and police cars and uh, some other fire brigades and so were were driving 
so we were being brought in a taxi out outside town uh, in a little, uh, uh, not a village, uh, but a little like an area with small houses. And uh, this was a, a family where the children had grown up and left the house and they had the facilities in the house to house houses. They had a big room in the basement where the, there were four beds. We were three children and my mother and uh, they took us in. We gave them all we had of the ration cards and uh, and they looked after us wonderfully and they uh, were absolute, absolutely wonderful people. But they were, uh, be it was becoming a bit of a problem because when this woman went shopping and uh, they knew in the sh small shops around that uh, she didn't have any children in a living home anymore and all of a sudden she was uh, bringing four liters of milk and uh, many eggs and a bit. and they were starting uh, asking her what is going on uh, at your at your house and she said well and she told them stories she had family that came over from Jutland and uh, some uh, some from the, the island and uh, uh, she told them stories. Well, but um, they start. My mother was worried. I mean, she they started uh, arranging for transport for us. It it uh, all the the flights or, or or boats that would sail Jews to Sweden. Um, were it, 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 they 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 wanted us to get to get out and to get over to Sweden, but my mother said, you know, she couldn't. She was um, um, worried. My what is going to happen uh, with my father, with her husband? So uh, she tried to postpone it, but the, in the end they said. You have to go. So on the 9th of October, we had been there now for eight days in the house, and uh, my little sister was running up. We they couldn't keep us inside. She was up in the street meeting other children, and my younger sister was as black, black shiny hair, quite Jewish looking. And uh, she told the other children, uh, very, um, uh, she wanted to impress them, and said, my father is in prison. So, you know, the people started getting worried. And uh, I, on the 9th, we were told, put all the clothes you have on you, take your toothbrush in your pocket, there's a taxi coming, waiting, taking you, and uh, they'll bring you we have arranged for a transport to Sweden for you. Well, they were driving us in this taxi into the old uh, university in the center of Copenhagen. And uh, we were let out and walked down in the basement under the university. And uh, it's very ancient, it's from the 1600 it was built. The, these. Uh, these, the old university. Anyhow, we come down into a big hall where full of people and uh, I, I guess it must have been around 160, 280. <laughs> well, anyhow, um, it, it, we were being registered and uh, sat down and there were big tables uh, arranged and they had prepared a very, very good, solid meal for everyone. They knew that this would be maybe our last meal in uh, quite some time. What had they done? They had done the best they could to the best of their knowledge, from whatever was available in the middle of the war. And what was it? 
smoked hamburger, chazel, right. <laughs> pork, and stewed vegetables. And uh, of course there were many people that didn't eat. My mother said, you know, this is an emergency situation. We eat what we get. We don't yeah. know when the next meal will come. So we ate and then they distributed uh, sleeping pills to everyone. And uh, not to take them now, but uh, we, um, it, after the meal, uh, then uh, they started uh, bringing, uh, calling people out. There were taxis were, uh, coming little by little with the intervals and uh, four or five people would go out every time and uh, they were being driven off and we didn't know where to. But um, after a while it was our turn and we were called out and uh, we are driving in this taxi and it's taking us uh, across the bridge to the island, you know, Copenhagen mm -hmm. is divided by uh, the harbour. And uh, we were taken across the two bridges uh, to the other side. And uh, But along uh, the, in the neighbourhood of the harbour area. And uh, then it stopped in a little street where I had to tell you the story later about this street because after the war, my youngest sister would live in this street. Wow. Now, well, but uh, we stopped outside uh, the entrance to uh, an apartment building, and a man came out, dressed in a house coat and uh, slippers, house slippers, and with a meerschaum pipe. And now my father was had always been reading us stories, so uh, I looked at this man. I said must be Sherlock Holmes, <laughs> this man. He came in, he didn't say much, but he directed the driver to go around uh, in the narrow streets and set us off on a place where there was uh, like a, a open coal storage, coal, the fire. And um, then uh, we were told to uh, it, it was right next to there was like the uh, small road going down to the harbor front and uh, all the way there were little uh, work workers cabins on the side of the road and we should hide behind and when we got a, a light from sign uh, from down near the harbor we should run to the next little cabin and from cabin to cabin uh, until we at last got, yeah, uh, because um, uh, there were four German patrol uh, patrollers uh, patrolling the harbour front and the quay, and uh, they would meet in front of this little road uh, when at some point they would be walking taught each other and then they would meet and clack their boots and then they would go and go back and we were supposed to when we got the sign from the one with the uh, with the torchlight we should run across to the big ship that was lying uh, right at the quay and quickly get down in the hull is it called the hull so uh, uh, so um, uh, there was a young man who was supposed to to help out and, uh, and 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 he said let me take some of the children and my mother said no 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 i'm responsible for my children and we were running like when we got the light we were running across got on board the the ship and came down the, uh, a long ladder down into the hall. It was full of people already. And uh, the, the, I mean, it was, uh, they, they, there were spread uh, blankets on, on the floor to sleep on. And people were lying like sardines. And um, well, we came and we found a place where we could lie down and we were told to take 
our sleeping pills and uh, we slept and uh, then uh, there came more people and more people but at one point apparently the the last people arrived and uh, then the captain closed the the door to to the hull and started p putting filling up with boxes and things we heard noises up there and uh, and then we people fell asleep and I just passed out I just don't remember anything I woke up much much later and it must have been the next morning this here was already late night when we arrived uh, next morning we hear heavy soldier boots on the deck they were they had uh, uh, they had to inspect the ship before they let it go out of the harbor so uh, they are tramping around up there and people are waking up and uh, you could hear people were afraid to 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 breathe then there's a baby no the minute we heard at the same time when the soldier boots were walking upstairs the uh, captain turned on the 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 motor to in case there should be noises that they shouldn't hear anything so there was a baby that started crying there were children and there were babies aboard also and uh, I just remember I heard I was at this point I was seven years old uh, I heard somebody saying put a pillow on pillow. I mean yeah you know choke the child fortunately it didn't happen because they calmed the child and uh, so the hysteria uh, went down and uh, then something very no then uh, the soldiers started getting interested in the boxes standing and uh, covering were these, uh, they German wanted. Soldiers? these were German, German soldiers yes and um, they started getting interested in uh, to see what is uh, moving around with it and then something very strange happened that the explanation came only many 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 years later what really happened up there what happened was that uh, after a little while they left it and then it was very quiet for a while and then all of a sudden we are lying down there in this darkness so many people and we hear them singing, singing German songs and um, very, very, very lively as if uh, there was a party going up on upstairs. And uh, then after a while we hear the footsteps, uh, they are getting off the ship and the ship starts sailing and we are on our way out. Now we out in the, when we entered the international waters, the captain came, opened, moved all the shit away from it and opened and said, come up and draw some fresh air. And uh, people came up and, and we all climbed up and uh, I'm standing there, I'm seven years old, I'm looking at people and looking, this, the strangest thing I had ever seen Everybody was black in the head. It was a coal boat with a lot full of the coal dust. Everybody was black in the head except for it was so hot and no air down there. So there was sweat dripping down, making white stripes in people's faces. And you know, I'm looking there, I'm looking at these weird creatures. And I think I was laughing <laughs> that everybody had turned into giraffes or, <laughs> or zebras. Well, anyhow, we were not up there very long because all of a sudden 
we were getting closer to Sweden and then came through the Falsterbo Canal. Um, Bornholm, the Danish island of Bornholm was further up in the Baltic Ocean, in the Baltic Sea. And uh, but uh, the the ferry boats to or the the ships to go be between Copenhagen were still passing twice a day, and uh, they were full of German soldiers. So uh, we were ordered quickly down below again for a short while. It didn't take long, and um, until he again opened up and he said, "Come up, we are uh, dry, we are sailing into Malmo." And we How long did it take the journey? Do you remember? Well, the the it must have been like uh, three four hours uh, of sailing uh, because also I think I heard I and I've never had it that they they had put um, in order to go into Swedish harbor they had put sugar in one of the motors and asked for permission to go in. For, for help and uh, then we came into the harbour. When we sailed into the harbour and people were standing there looking and all of a sudden one started screaming, they have cheated us. She sees that the Swedish soldiers had the same green uniforms as the German soldiers and there went uh, like uh, you know a, a panic, a hysteria, and until the captain came out and told them that it's everything is okay, calm down, calm down. It is we are sailing into a Swedish harbor. These are Swedish soldiers. They are our friends. Judith, what caused the singing on the boat? Do you, the what? Why were they singing on the boat? Before it left, who was doing the singing? Ah, uh, the singing. Okay, this is the story that many, 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 many years later, my sister, who was born after my father had returned from uh, imprisonment, in he was sent to uh, work camps and from one camp to another, and the reason that he survived the war, I can only say. Either he has been amazingly, amazingly strong in his will and in his love for the family, combined with miracle after miracle after miracle. So, um, my sister is living, this is the story, uh, she is living in the same street, right opposite from where we had stopped with a taxi, where Sherlock Holmes came out to um, to 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 lead us to the right place, and um, my mother's with her, and they're sitting there talking, and they are deciding. My mother says, "Why don't we write a letter to the local newspaper?" telling about how we were saved by people from this area who had arranged for this trip. Ask if we, uh, we are asking, is anybody alive still who knows and about this and who remembers? If so, please contact us. We want to, to meet you and kind of uh, Thank you. close the circle and say thank you. And uh, they are writing it, it's printed. The day after it's been printed and distributed, they get a call and uh, from a woman by the name of Ulla. And uh, she says, I know, I know who uh, the people were who arranged this, this uh, trip with the, with the boat. It was my sister and her husband, Harry. Unfortunately, Harry died many years ago, but um, but my sister is very sick. She is hospitalized. I'm going to read her this article today. And uh, this is what she does. And her sister, uh, Gwiron, 
says, yes, it was me and Harris, and, uh, but I have written all, I have documented it and uh, delivered all my stories uh, about our actions to the uh, Liberation Museum. And uh, you can find it there, she said. But I will give them a call tomorrow when... Uh, and the thing is, tomorrow didn't happen. She died overnight. Oh. But I got all the... Um, all the correspondence that she had, and among them the letter where she describes this action. Now what happened? They were friends with the captain. And the captain is getting worried that the Germans start uh, fussing around, and they say, Harry Snow's German, he studied in Germany. You are living two minutes from here, take your dog, as if you are out just for, for a walk, and come by and uh, Harris will start talking to these Germans and get the, their mind off what they are uh, doing here. Uh, she, and uh, so this is what they did. She, uh, as she's, they are leaving the house, she looks in, in her cupboard and what does she find in there? In 43, on the, in October, a bottle of French cognac. She puts it in her pocket and they walk over to the ship, which is right by almost, and uh, they get on board the ship. Harris immediately starts conversing, uh, talking with these germs and, uh, and uh, asking, where are you from and how is your family and blah, blah, whatever, whatever. And she goes in to the captain's little cabin, puts on hot water for coffee, and puts cups out on the little table and uh, uh, and uh, puts little glasses and then she says what are you doing out here in it's so cold aren't you i have a cup of coffee here what could couldn't you come in and she gets them in gets them seated and she starts pouring in the cognac in the glasses and they are happy and they're talking and talking and little by little she keeps filling their glasses and they are getting quite in the mood and uh, and then they start the, all the, the singing starts uh, the singing and they are very happy and all of a sudden they remember oh they have to stamp the papers and uh, uh, and be ready for uh, for for letting the ship go and then uh, we hear them us lying down there, they are tramping off the boat and the boat starts and he turns on full speed and uh, sails out of the harbour. What a miracle! Yeah. That's incredible. Yes. How many people were on this ship? Do you know 180. How many? Was it quite a large uh, boat or ship? It was a, a big uh, a boat transporting coal for a big factory that was lying right next to this was the coal storage. It was bringing coal from Lübeck in Germany. It was sailing daily between Lübeck and Copenhagen. Look and up. in between, uh, this I saw in her letter, she told that on the way he would also bring uh, uh, resistance fighters that had to leave and, uh, and weapons for uh, bring from Sweden. He was also bringing in uh, weapons for the resistance. Dude, that's incredible. I just want to mention too, one amazing thing about Denmark is that the Jews never had to wear the yellow star. That's right. I think because the king... He no, this was, uh, what's his name, the one who wrote the uh, Exodus. This was in his book. He he put it in there, but it didn't happen. It didn't happen. No. But but y y your family and uh, none of the Jews had to wear the yellow star. No. No. That's incredible. And wow. But. Um, were you very scared when you were in the night going from the one cabin to the next to go into the boat? You know, it's, we have, we sisters, we have talked about this 
so many times because we hear stories from other people that they suffer from tra trauma, post uh, uh, trauma, after, uh, and uh, even in the second generation, none of us suffer any traumas. And you know what? I give my mother the credit. She must have been such an amazingly strong woman, alone with three children, a husband sitting in the prison, in uh, being beaten, in uh, I missed the word now, but um, and and with no income. How how did she manage? Yes, to give us the feeling of security that as long as we are together, everything is fine. None of us have any kind of traumas from what we have gone through. I mean, listen, the being uh, woken up at night by uh, soldiers hammering on the on the door and searching for my father night after night and that could it. give that could give uh, <laughs> give you plenty of reason for traumas but no i tell you i i keep telling my sisters we are now we are only three of us alive but i'm saying we chose our parents very very cleverly can i ask you you really did what about extended family were they also saved, all the... Yes, yes, except... Do you have, you have a picture of your, uh, your, your parents and... Yes, uh, this is after the war, is it clear? Yeah. And you are on the, the right? Uh, on the what? You're on the... You. Uh, 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 yeah. How old are you in this picture? In this picture I must be... When we came back I was 7 or 9. I think I'm, I must be 9. And this is before my youngest sister was born. Oh. After the reunion of the family. So Judith, can I ask you, when you arrived in Sweden, what do you remember about going off the boat and who met you there when you arrived well, in Malmö? Um, there, it was so nicely organized. By the time we came, the Swedes had really managed to... We were all checked for typhus. But, uh, and, but we came with nothing and they had collected clothing. We got, first of all, they gave us food and drink. And uh, after that, uh, we was given uh, uh, clothing to change and shoes and uh, they, we were taken so wonderfully care of and then we were brought out to the first uh, uh, ref, uh, uh, camp for refugees uh, where we stayed for quite a short time and then in the meantime while we were there my mother discovered where my grandparents had uh -huh. uh, were were stationed and she managed to get them together so we were then transferred to a place near the southern tip of Sweden where there was an, an like a, a summer hotel it was closed for the winter and there we spent uh, the whole winter and uh, early spring with, with your grandparents with with with, with our grandparents yeah, but uh, we we had, and uh, from then we went through met uh, quite a few camps until they, for the last year, we were in a small provincial town. They had found us an apartment, and there we went to school. My mother had a job there, and um, my grandparents were with us, and uh, it was nice. And there, when we were there. 
we were told from the Red Cross that we could send parcels to my father in Germany and uh, uh, this is a whole other story here I could tell you about uh, a German woman who was studying med medicine in Denmark and Norway and uh, but uh, what the Germans did she was working for Gestapo but what the Germans didn't know she was also working with the resistance and she was keeping check of all the Danish prisoners in Germany uh, where when wherever they were moved from place to place she was uh, we were we were getting information from her it's amazing because she worked for the Gestapo and also for the, yeah, yeah, the resistance. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we knew where to send the parcels to. Wow. Yeah. And you, do you know her name? Or? Yeah. Hilgun Sassenhaus. Was she ever made Chesedei Mutalam? What righteous mm. amongst the nations? No, I don't. I don't think so. We had a little problem with her. She couldn't understand that after the war, she tried to convince my parents to baptize us ah. and to to make us safe. And um, so, when my younger sister was born, she says, "Please call her Hilgund." And my parents said, "We cannot call her Hilgund in Denmark." But uh, we call her Helen. I said similar. Yeah. And when your mother found out that your father was still alive, she must have been so relieved. Yes, uh, we, were, we were not sure. Uh, when he was rescued, he was rescued by the... I have to tell you the story. I mean, I'm taking your time. No, no, no. Uh, oh, yeah, this is... Uh, I have to tell you the story. He was at the... When after the uh, Americans had uh, landed uh, on the French coast, um, they approached and came up near. My father was at this point in a prison in Siegburg, which is in the Ruhr Gebiet. And uh, they were under, when the, German, when the Americans were approaching, uh, the front line, the, the, the prison was lying almost on the front line. They were being bombarded by mistake by the Americans and by the Germans. And, um, and there was a terrible situation there. With, uh, they also had an infestation of a kind of typhoid that was spread by lice, uh, pleptyphus. And... Um, mm. Um, as the, the fighting got worse, uh, the the people, uh, the staff from the prison fled and left the, all the prisoners alone without supplies, without water, without electricity, without food. And um, my father was in a group that would go down to the river uh, that was uh, in, in the neighborhood to bring water back to the prison and one day they hear people on the other side of the river speaking English and they made contact with them and they told them we are in a terrible terrible need here we but uh, some of the soldiers crossed the river and brought them chocolates and chewing gum and cigarettes and things to bring back to the to the prisoners and they said, we'll keep you in mind, but we cannot uh, liberate you now. We'll bring supplies, food, but we have, they, had, they had to make a, a big uh, around in order to uh, uh, get the uh, Germans uh, to withdraw. And uh, it took three weeks, and the, my father in his diary is telling how people died of the typhus and, and in these three weeks, and how it, the bomb, the bomb, the bombardments were terrible. They were falling in and uh, destroying a big part of the prison. Anyhow, in the end, they were liberated by the Americans, and my father was brought. This was in March of '45. He was brought to Belgium for a recreation uh, uh, to start 
getting used to eating and walking. To recuperate. And, yes, to recuperate. And um, he was there for some months and uh, getting better. And uh, we were brought back to Denmark on the 30th of May. We were not brought immediately. The, uh, the liberation was on the 5th of May, the Germans surrendered. And uh, but until they got organized to get arranged for us, transport, etc., and uh, it was on the third, 30th of May. Now, as we are sailing, we are coming down from, we were living up near Stockholm, and we come by train into Malmö, and we are getting aboard the ferry boat. As we are sailing towards the harbor, we hear an an, an enormous transport plane, an American transport plane landing, going in for landing in Kastrup. And uh, we are getting, uh, we are going to the railroad station, we are going to, my mother had some um, uh, holiday parents, a Christian couple, uh, elderly couple, they didn't have any children of their own, but uh, all the years uh, since my mother was a little girl, she had spent the summers there, and we as children had spent the most wonderful time with these people. We had nowhere else to go, uh, and naturally we went to them, and they received us with, uh, like, I mean, uh, relatives. <laughs> wow. I mean, they were relatives. I mean, being Christians, and being, it was never a problem with us. They didn't take us to church. I mean, they respected us and we respected them. And as we are there, it, a woman comes, uh, uh, she has been bicycling in. She says, your father is coming by the train. And we were just uh, very five minutes from the train station, so we get out of the house and I run ahead of them and I'm coming around the bend of the road and I see a strange looking man with a coat down to his feet almost open and with two bags in his hands. And I'm stopping, I'm freezing and it, he stops up and and then I see he puts down the two bags and opens his arms. I, could, I didn't recognize him. I mean, he didn't look like my father. My father was athletic, strong, always suntanned, but it was him. I jumped on him and I'm happy I didn't push him over. And uh, that was it. Must have been one of the most emotional moments of your life. Yes, absolutely. I tell you, if you think I don't have tears in my eyes when I tell it. And when your mother saw him and your other your, your sisters, they must yes. have... They, Denmark arranged for us a month in, um, in a, in a uh, what you call it, in, in a, a, a hotel on the beach for a whole month, no work, everything paid for, wow. just to be together again as a family. That is something unbelievable. Yeah. This is after the war. And they had, yeah, and they had saved an apartment for us in a new, uh, um, new buildings that they had uh, kept in store for Jewish families coming back from Sweden. Truth, you know what I will say, I've, I've heard, and I've heard this from survivors as well, that yeah. a lot of the homes were kept just as it was, yeah. nobody took anything. Yeah. Well, our home was not, we lived, you know, very, very, very modestly. We didn't have any fancy stuff in our home, but our neighbors had saved everything, kept it in the, in the basement, so, um, so we had something to start with, and, uh, and uh, we were given a lot of assistance. Yeah. No, other people lived in the apartment we had lived in. But everything that you had, your neighbors had kept? Yes. Books and everything. It's amazing. Yeah. And then you, you, you did you live with your family in, in Copenhagen after the war for... Yes, yes, yes. I was, uh, I mean, 
I was home. I was a little schoolgirl. I was nine years old, and uh, and I stayed with my family until I, I when I started to, uh, I went in. I became a nurse. It took me three years in uh, to become a nurse. So I stayed home until I was eighteen. Wow! And when did you meet your husband? Hmm on the stairs of the uh, Jewish uh, community. His mother lived on the second floor, my grandparents lived on the third floor. <laughs> uh, and he was also a survivor, he was also... <laughs> yeah, no, he, he was uh, a, a different story. I mean, he was the one that during the uh, German occupation went back into Denmark, he got worried, he said. He heard in Sweden what happened to these synagogues in Europe. And he said, well, the Copenhagen synagogue might be the last synagogue in, uh, in the world. He went back and met a friend from the resistance and together they arranged, they broke into the synagogue and brought in car, uh, wooden boxes packed everything that uh, all the also the personal things they 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 numbered everything and put uh, the names on when they emptied all the f for each one that had his little enclosed uh, packed everything and all the uh, the not the uh, the Torah scrolls in the main um, cabinet, but all the other ones that were stuck up uh, in, in little cupboards, he had been there very uh, much with his father when, uh, when, uh, when uh, he was a child, so he and his brother knew everything that was, what was hidden in every cupboard in, uh, in the synagogue. And they had it packed and they had it sent to the Norwegian troops in in uh, in north of uh, uh, no the German troops in Norway in two big uh, uh, caverns, but um, when the uh, there were no trains going up through Norway, so it had uh, they had. Uh, uh, Sweden had an arrangement with a with a German troop, a German uh, military, that they could travel through Sweden. So they traveled, and until it came to a place in mid Sweden, the people from the resistance unlocked the last two wagons uh, on the train with all the uh, contents of the synagogue and then they spread it out among the various uh, refugee camps uh, in Sweden. And one, one little story more. She came to visit his mother and uh, they had uh, like a little stibbele uh, for a synagogue and he says, but I don't have uh, a talit. And then uh, a man says, well, but we got these boxes full of wow. stuff. Uh, he had, uh, uh, pick yourself a talit and and he goes through and he looks and he won't believe it. He won't believe it. He picks up his own talit from his bar, mi bar mitzvah. His own talit? His own talit. And when my son was bar mitzvah, he, he was with his uh, talit. Wow. Yeah. With the same talis? Yeah. Yes. That's amazing. And is this a, do you have a picture of your, your husband? Uh, yes. It's the same. This is incredible. Oops. What an amazing. I'll tell you the most, the most amazing man. Truth, this is, what a phenomenal, it's just unbelievable. Yeah. So he went back to, to rescue from the, the, yeah. the synagogue yeah. and then he managed to get back to Sweden? Yes, yes. And then he joined the Danish Brigade in Sweden 
and um, on the uh, 5th of May when the Germans uh, surrendered he was already back in uh, in, in, in a uniform with the Danish brigade that had been formed and trained during the war. Wow. And how many years were you married? Until he died in 2006. For almost 50 years. Wow. Yeah. I was 25 when I met him. He was 40 and divorced with two children he had with an American crazy rich woman. <laughs> but I tell you, this man made my life. I've had such a wonderful life. And maybe his memory be for eternal blessing. Wow. <laughs> Judith, this is absolutely unbelievable. So? So Judith, I really just want to thank you um, so much. If you. Um, this has really been, and this is your, your dear family. Yes, but uh, this is after my, my husband died. Then we had these two extra little girls. My, my own children are not here yet. I, I, I moved in and then uh, my landlord said he didn't want too many holes in the walls. So I have seven packed away. <laughs> We could, I just want to thank you so much if we yeah. could take a seat. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, I know. But I just want to. Uh -huh. Judith, really, I am so extremely grateful to you. Um, you know, I'm really, I'm happy to share my story, wow. and I, 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 I really, uh, I, I'm what, uh, t telling the story about how the Danish Danes went out of their way and risk their risk their yeah, lives, lives to 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 save us and I'm telling it here because because I want I want people to try and understand that there's a reason that it happened in Denmark and it has to do with education 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 and tolerance and understanding that just because somebody is different it's true uh, wow. So, Judith, I must just tell you, there are no words, really. Your story is miracles, Nisim. It's, you know, I just want to mention something. With your father, a lot of the, there were some Danes, as I'm sure you know, that unfortunately they didn't leave the house that night and they stayed in the homes and they were sent to Theresienstadt. Yeah. There were some that. It's, it's yeah, I know, I know. There were God about 400. Yeah. 53, yeah. 53 died yeah. in Theresien Stadt. Nobody was sent uh, on to the... Uh, but in Theresien Stadt itself they died. But yeah. it's amazing that okay. they didn't send your father to Theresien Stadt. No, it's a, it's a, it's no, a, he was a political prisoner. He was together with uh, common murderers and thieves sure. and... Uh, did they know that he was Jewish? Uh, at some point they did. Uh, because some uh, a Norwegian fellow told the, the Germans that he was Jewish. He had gotten a special uh, preferential uh, job where he was uh, could uh, help his friends with bring a little more food or so. So this German, uh, this Norwegian told to the Germans and then he was put in a little cube for uh, three weeks where he couldn't stand and uh, cold and uh, with uh, hardly any food that he survived that is a miracle. I tell you, I have it in his diaries. I have done... In the diaries you, you've donated to Yad Vashem? Yeah. Yeah, but I have translated them. It's with his uh, handwriting. It's in Danish. I have translated for my... Do I do it now? I have translated for my grandchildren to English because they, they, they all know English. So Judith, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. I really, I'm so incredibly grateful to you. No, and your I'm story happy. is so inspiring and you are so inspiring and you are just, it's, it's just unbelievable. And mm. to see that you were never, that you went through a major trauma, but you, 
It's, it's unbelievable that you... I tell you, I tell you, the way what you, I told you my and sisters, your family have dealt we with. have chosen our parents very carefully. <laughs> well, your yeah, parents were blessed to have you as children as well. Yeah, yeah, but and you know, no, I, I mean, the gene pool. <laughs> well, you should just know. have a maybe stream to 120 in good health and muzzle and brocha, and you should just enjoy your children and grandchildren and I tell you, you okay. are such an example for all of us to emulate. You really are, and I don't know. I just I I enjoy <sighs> the life I have, and you know, and I don't waste I don't waste any time because when you are in my age, time becomes um, valuable, very valuable, and you never know. I mean, listen, things happen to people. Now I'm fine. Who knows? So, God, so I'm, I'm swimming and I'm watching birds and wow. I'm mushroom picking. I'm doing everything. I love nature, and uh, I love children. I love people, and uh, I have had a full life. And Judith, can I ask what what message do you impart to your grandchildren or to the future generations? I mean, you you really witnessed the, what what I do. Well, what, me, what, 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 message, what message would you give over? Take care of nature. Let us not ruin the precious nature we have been given. But also, I think you said something very, very profound, that the Danish people were very tolerant and they accepted yeah. somebody who was different to them. Yeah, well, there was a Nazi party in Denmark also. But... Uh, but uh, the Jewish community had been so well integrated in Denmark and had such so much influence in uh, in culture and in literature and in uh, in all spheres that uh, they were considered Danish with a different religion. And Judith, coming to Israel, you happy that you made this decision to come live in Israel? Yeah, mostly. I'm not uh, always so proud of what's going on here, but... Uh, How long have you been here? Well, I came first time when I had finished. Uh, I was a, first a nurse, then I became a kindergarten teacher, and then I made two years in Israel. I came here when I was 23, I returned when I was 25. I, here I got involved with archaeology and I have later studied archaeology, prehistory uh, of the Near East. And you have a daughter that works in, with, with Yad Vashem? Um, my, my daughter-in-law. Your daughter-in-law? Yeah, yeah. So the message, and you are very willing to give over your story to um, Zikron Basalon and to groups that come uh, here? Absolutely, because I think that there's a message that uh, what happened uh, to the Jewish people in the Holocaust could maybe have been different if people were educated differently for tolerance, for tolerance and for love of uh, of, pe of yeah, love of people of, of your fellow human being yeah. yeah yeah well your message is so unbelievable Judith and you are amazing and I'm I exceptionally don't grateful I to don't you. feel so amazing I can tell you <laughs> Judith can we have another look at that picture of your parents because your parents are also yeah they must have been the most remarkable yeah. remarkable people yeah where should I hold it this is wonderful so may wow, your mother and your father and wow, may their memories just be for eternal blessing, really. And Judith, thank you so, so very much. Thank you for coming. Last, last time they were t uh, lit for Shabbat and the holiday candles were when my grandmother lived. And that is many, many years ago. I had one of them. And then this year when I was in Denmark, by chance I see standing in some, in, in, in a shed. And 
I, I realize that this is the couple that belong together and for the first time now here for the holidays I could light them uh, as a couple for the holiday. It was uh, so emotional, I can't tell you. And these are the candlesticks that you all came from Russia? They, they brought them with them uh, in the beginning in uh, when they came from Russia in 1905. This is your grandparents? Yes. And yeah. on it it's engraved? They are engraved here with the names. Where is it? Here, wait. Here it says. Here. Here it says, Laser Mayev, father and mother, Shane Mayev. And it says more, more. More. And, and this says far. This is. And father. you found the. You yes. only had one and. Yes, I had one. Now I have them and I enjoy them so much. It's, uh, I mean, it's, it, it's emotional beyond words. Wow, did you, how did you come across it? Uh, by, by chance. It's a miracle. Pure chance, it's, it's yes. Miracle. It's, yes, it's, yeah. yes, wow, they're heavy. And, and you've, uh, you've lit candles on them? Oh yes, of course. I mean, I'm not religious, but I light Shabbat candles and I bake halot for every Shabbat every year since I was 25. You know what, it's not religious, it's, it's in your heart. And it's, it is, it's yes. <laughs> yeah. You did another miracle, another incredible nice. Yeah. Really. yeah. It's very beautiful. No, I was asking around for years and years, who has the other one who has of this set of candles? And, and were they willing to sell it to you? Not sell. No, no, no. It was, uh, it was just standing there. Somebody they said, well, I've had it for 100 years. She, she says, I never light candles. She says, take it. Unbelievable. Yeah. That is something 